say everybody's names, but that's all right. Uh, so I'm Daniel Schumann, Policy Director with Demand Progress, and uh, also help run the Congressional Data Coalition. And we're going to start with a pop quiz. But not for our panelists, but for the people in the audience, just to make sure people are still awake, which they certainly <laughs> should be. So what was the first congressional website, not this panel, who had the first congressional website? Shout it out if you know the answer, not you, Alex. Anybody? Really? Nobody knows this? OK, Alex, you want to shout it out? You don't know? OK, guys. Who had the first congressional website? James Madison. Oh. No. <laughs> Anybody else? Senator Kennedy, hmm? actually. First congressional website. Which one? Uh, Ted. OK. Yeah. Yeah, the others would mm, not so much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so good. Well, so that was not as successful as I had thought, but it was kind of fun anyway. Uh, so when you look to the Constitution, uh, which is where all great Sunshine Week panel conversations start, um, built into the Constitution is the idea of communications between the population and the government. And um, in this case, it's embedded in the postal roads and the, the clause that allows uh, commerce and communication between uh, different aspects of uh, the people and the government so that you would have newspapers that could be transmitted freely and um, uh, would be subsidized by the government, as well as people being able to communicate with their legislators by letter. And over time, those methods of communication have changed. We had telegraph, we had fax machines, uh, we have email, which I'm sure is the bane of most people's existence here, which we're going to talk about a little have bit. Have fax machines. Still have fax machines. Mm -hmm. but you still have telegra telegraphs as well, I think. Like it, it's actually possible still to send a telegram, um, but it's really, really weird uh, if you try to do it. Uh, so <laughs> what we have is a panel of directors up here. Everybody here is a director of some sort. So we'll start uh, just to introduce everyone first. We have uh, Jessica Seal. She is the digital director uh, for Senator Cornyn. Uh, next is Jessica Presley, who is the digital director. Now, are you digital director for Oversight Government Reform? Digital comms director Di for OGR. Thank you. I'm, see, I should have not started with the director thing, because now I'm going to get everybody's <laughs> titles slightly wrong. So I'll look at my notes. So Steve, I had you as the director of online communications and technology. Is that still correct? Senior advisor, but whatever. Senior yeah. advisor. All right. So that's what you, so you were the former. Yeah. <laughs> the former digital uh, uh, for uh, Representative Hoyer, and of course, the executive director, ooh, Seamus Kraft from the Open Gov Foundation, who is also a former digital director, digital something, I don't know. I, I had their jobs before they did. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that seems to work a lot in this room where everybody seems to I think you created my job. I think, think we did. Uh, so these are a panel of experts on Congress, uh, and we're going to talk about digital civic engagement, but everybody sort of is here for a couple of reasons. One is because they're all doing something that's kind of interesting. I feel like I'm bouncing up and down this year. It's kind of fun. Uh, so let's start with, with Jessica. So uh, you guys have, I can either set it up or you can just do it. So, so Jessica, okay. Senator Cornyn has been doing a number of sort of innovative ways of engaging uh, with constituents uh, online. Can you talk a little bit about sort of the efforts that have been taking place there? Sure. So um, I think my favorite thing about, I guess, digital comms is, or social media and email in particular, um, is kind of cutting out the middleman between going to reporters and then relying on people consuming news through their news sources and then just going directly to the source. Um, I really like the data feedback from that as well. Uh, so that's what we try and focus on, is getting as much information as possible out through direct communication channels, and that's through a very robust um, email newsletter system. I think we have about a shade under 10 million people in our email list at this point. It's Texas. Um, yeah, well, we do have 28 million constituents, so, so we're still working. Um, there's some growth there. Um, and as, in addition to all of our social media platforms, Senator Cornyn's very active on Twitter. Don't know if you've noticed. Um, he also lately is really into Instagram, so that's fun. Um, and so <laughs> uh, I think the way that we try to use these, besides just um, as a broadcasting platform, which allows us to kind of uh, beta test messaging, mm -hmm. um, kind, of do, kind of do some tweaking and see what the responses are. But um, I like to solicit feedback. So we have built in um, some really good polling mechanisms that go directly into our CRM and our database, uh, our email database, and that allows us to kind of gauge where people are at on certain issues without spending any additional money. Um, and then we also have um, sort of a feedback feature where occasionally we'll ask for stories. Um, we did recently on tax reform, and so 
uh, a few poor members of our team get to read all of those responses. I think we're at like 7,000 right now. Um, and, and what comes out of those are really cool stories and anecdotes that Senator Cornyn then integrates into a range of things, um, mostly floor speeches, but um, other events as well. Um, Can I ask you a question on sure. that? So, so you had told, so we did pre-interviews because of course this is all baked, right? Um, so one thing that you said that was really kind of interesting is how sen the senator engages directly with the communications. Could you talk about that just for a minute? Sure, so if you ever tweet John Cornyn on Twitter and he responds to you, that's him. <laughs> um, we, the Senate has an interesting uh, set of rules that's a little different than other government agencies and, and the lower chamber. Um, <laughs> in that... <laughs> wait, wait. The other <laughs> chamber. Um, uh, People's house. <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in that we are, uh, senators are able to maintain personal accounts that are neither official nor campaign. And so if, if there is no third party staff access, the senator is allowed to um, tweet campaign or official material kind of just at will, the way you would use your own, right? Um, you don't give up being a private citizen as an elected official. And I, and I think the Senate creates an interesting space for that. Um, so he engages directly and kind of taking our cues from him and his priority in terms of um, direct engagement, we read and respond to like about 95% of our Facebook comments in terms of reading, not in terms of responding. <laughs> um, and there we like, to in, uh, we like to emphasize responding to questions that are genuine with primary source documents in particular. Um, and it also enables us to kind of uh, connect people with our casework team if they need help with social security or a veterans issue um, or any of the other number of services that Congress generally provides. Um, and, and can you just, just on that point, so again, another thing that I just sort of want to draw out so if someone puts a comment on the senator's Facebook page saying that they need help with something, mm -hmm. what happens? So what happens is we have a team of people, and this stays in our comms house, which makes it a little different than sending an email or um, making a phone call or sending a fax. Gosh, those faxes. Um, <laughs> so if you make a comment on Facebook or on Twitter, members of the communications staff reads it, sometimes me. Um, in the past, it was always me, and thank goodness it isn't anymore because everybody's full of constructive compliments for Congress. Um, the most popular branch of government. Probably. Probably. <laughs> it's not a very high bar. No. Um, so uh, anyway, so a member of our comm staff reads it, and if it needs attention, we I will flag it internally for our casework team so that they can follow up through our database as well as, like, externally replying and saying, please call this number. Um, we'll see if we can help you. Um, so there are a number of different ways. Occasionally, if something is really serious uh, or threatening, it will get flagged for Capitol Police. Uh, the FBI has been known to show up on people's doorsteps. Mm. Um, and, and then more often, it, it's just um, somebody's read a news story or blog, and it, it does, like they've got some wrong information, and so we're replying with congress.gov links or um, kind of leaning on primary source documents to help people learn how to navigate um, and find those resources for themselves. Do you, can you, and just very quickly, because I want, I want to get to everyone yeah, else. But no, no, you're great. Can you give me a sense of like, what's the volume? So like how many comments do you get on, say, Facebook, for example, in a day or in a week or something like that? Um, so in 2017, the average number of comments on each Facebook post was about 2,200. Um, just a lot. Yep, and you're setting us up for the folks at the end of the panel so we can talk about scale. So that's just, just previews of coming attractions. So uh, Jessica Presley, mm -hmm. thank you Jessica Seal. Um, <laughs> so you're with uh, the Minority for Oversight and Government Reform uh, and you guys do have a, you, you sort of got two really cool initiatives that I'd love for you to talk about. One is the collaboration that you've got with the Senate on sort of the digital communications and I'd also, if you could talk about the whistleblower uh, piece of it as well, I'd love to hear both of those things. Sure, okay, so uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys know this. I, when you think about the House or the Senate, they're basically little small businesses, right? And so the caucus does an amazing job trying, tying together communications messages. But sometimes there's a disconnect between the different offices of pooling resources, what messages are you guys doing, what's the latest trends, tips and tricks. And so what we did is we created a bicameral Democratic Digital Communications Staff Association. Steve is one of our co-founders as well. And it's in an effort to team together offices. 
And a lot of different times, I'm sure this happens in the Senate as well, uh, a chief of staff or a staff director will see a junior staffer who comes in and they'll say, oh, well, you're young. You know that Snapchat thing. Uh, you should just do that digital presence stuff. Right? And it happens a lot. And so it's a problem. And so how can we, as a staff association, train those junior staff members in not only technology, because it is a lot of different program work, right? but then also in security? Because a lot of different times, the digital person is the security de facto of the office. right? And so how do we do information security hygiene practices? How can we protect our members and our offices? because that is our absolute number one concern as a staff or protecting our member, right? And so that's, that's one of our big initiatives as a staff association. Um, and so you can check us out at uh, demsdigital.com. Um, but then for the whistleblower aspect for, uh, for us, being in uh, the oversight committee, one of our, and as an ex-oversight committee staffer, like three out of four here, uh, one of the most important things for us are whistleblowers. And we go to great lengths to protect whistleblowers. And a lot of different times, whenever you're thinking about websites, so for example, uh, for Digital Day on the Hill, we had a breakout session, which was, uh, so Digital Day on the Hill was an event that our staff association hosted. Over 200 different uh, staffers came. Cory Booker was there. He opened everything up. It was amazing. Uh, and so one of the bit different breakout sections that we had was uh, website analysis, right? And so we would look at your website and we would say, okay, so this is what works, this is what doesn't. You know, maybe we should think more about loading times. You know, people are just going there for contacts. And so as a staffer, looking at your analytics and seeing what do you need, right? And so for oversight, it was whistleblowers. People just came to our website for whistleblowers and to contact us. And so when we redesigned our website, we redesigned it in a way that whistleblower constantly was on the screen in multiple locations. And so we make it as easy as possible to find that section so then someone from council can reach back to those whistleblowers. And do you find that people are using it? Definitely, hands down without question. Like how, so how has it changed your workflow? Like, how, like is this a new, have you increased the number of people that are contacting you? Have you changed the mechanism by which they, like what has that done? So, I'm, I'm not at liberty to say exactly how much things have increased. Yes. Uh, things definitely have increased. Mm. Uh, the, the flow, though, now is a lot easier. Mm. And it's because of the back-end system that we created yeah. in order to make sure that different councils get it. Well, that's interesting. And we can talk later about, as was brought up in the last panel, about the fun of working with lawyers. Uh, and as a lawyer, I can talk about how fun lawyers are <laughs> uh, in, in terms of like what it must have taken to sort of like make those processes change. And that actually is a good segue to Steve, because talking about changing processes in the House, you, you're sort of a, a, a veteran of trying to reimagine uh, the way the House can serve the public. Uh, and uh, you've built a number of sort of interesting tools and, and exposed a lot of information to the public. If, you, if there's a favorite sort of success that you'd like to talk about in the way that you're sort of re-engineering the way Congress has functioned, uh, I'd certainly love to hear about it. Sure. Um, I've been lucky enough to play that role because my boss, Mr. Hoyer, has really prioritized, uh, sort of sees himself as an institutionalist and knows that a big part of that these days is improving the technology uh, infrastructure. Um, so uh, he's allowed me to pursue these things um, and others in my office. Um, probably the most popular is um, one of our recent projects, uh, only a couple years old, uh, a WhipWatch app. Um, one of our primary responsibilities in the WHIPS office is to just alert the members and staff when votes are and uh, the democratic position on votes. So Dems are urged to vote yes or no. Um, and this is just really important information that's always gone out in emails. Um, but, you know, members of Congress's emails are a mess, just like all the rest of us. Uh, and so just separating that out and putting it in its own app with its own custom notifications was immediately... Um, very popular um, with the members themselves uh, and with staff. And it was also, you know, it, most good technology innovations inside government are also a great transparency opportunity because it was just super easy for us to open that tool up to the public. And, uh, you know, not that many people in the world care about the vote to vote happenings of the House of Representatives, but I, I estimate around 10,000 people do. Um, and we're up around 5,000 uh, heavy active users. Um, so a lot of those people are, you know, lobbyists, advocates, 
um, press that cover the, the Congress, um, not to mention staff and members, um, including uh, on the other side of the aisle. Uh, I hear a number of Republican members uh, like to use the app as well. Yeah, and, and we'll, we'll get to one of the points that you identified, which is, so you said, you know, there's five to 10,000 users. Those are five to 10,000 direct users, mm -hmm. right? There's the role of intermediaries. You heard the conversation earlier uh, where folks were talking about, well, how do you, you know, these public-private partnerships. Well, there's this engagement that you guys have helped to create with civil society, with journalists, and with others, so that you know maybe it's 10,000 people directly, but of course then there's the people who then turn around and you transmit that information to their folks. So it's actually like this sort of pyramid of engagement, which is, did you like that was a pyramid of engagement? That's kind of cool, right? <laughs> uh, but there's the amplification effect that takes place as Jessica and Jessica are both rolling their eyes simultaneously at me. Uh, so moving to people who roll their eyes regularly at me, Seamus, uh, who, thank you, uh, who is a, uh, a refugee from uh, the House Oversight Committee. Recovering Hill staffer. Recovering Hill staffer. Uh, so apparently you did this study, it turns out, on well, how... Well, she did. You, well, I'm getting to that. <laughs> so you, the collective you, the plural you, uh, the Eustedes version, uh, did, a, did a... Oh, come on. No... I laugh. <laughs> we need to get more like, like some microphones in the audience so like, we can at least amplify some of the stuff. Um, so you did a study on uh, how constituents engage with their congressional offices. And basically what you said is that everything that everybody thinks is entirely wrong. So in three minutes or so, sort of high level, what are we getting wrong? And then I'm going to turn to uh, what we should do. What so. a setup. I should take this guy on the road. Um, I, I was just in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not that everything is wrong, uh, but the way that we've been looking about meaningful engagement at scale today uh, has a lot to be desired. Um, so I'll, I'll take the, the dark first act, and I'll throw it to my friend Molly Ruskin, who I will introduce here as uh, the person that led our amazing, first of its kind, user-centered research exploration into the systems, culture, and constraints of engaging with congressional office, offices. It's called From Voicemails to Votes. You're uh, stealing you can, my entire introduction. You can, you you can access it at V2V <laughs> at OpenGov Foundation, V2V.OpenGovFoundation.org. But this is the first time that uh, user-centered research happened in congressional offices, uh, starting from the, the place of uh, it's pretty clear that the public is frustrated with their engagement options with Congress whether it's Facebook, faxes, in-person visits, phone calls, letters, you name it, uh, things are not working anywhere close to the way that they should, right? When you're asked for your standard of customer service, it's Amazon, right? It's not Congress. But Amazon, I believe, is, is not enshrined in you know, the First Amendment of the Constitution when we talk about the right to petition your government for the redress of grievances. This is a problem. Um, the thing that people hadn't really dived into yet is what happens, right, when this mass volume of which we're all aware hits the institution of call Congress, what happens? Um, and the superpower that Molly helped us bring to bear on this is no one would really step back and say, where does it go, right? When a fax comes in, who does what when? Who are those people? Are they untrained interns? Are they legislative correspondents? And what happens there? And how long does it take? Where are the inefficiencies? Where are the pain points? And where are the opportunities? Um, some of the data and the findings I'll just read to you in brief. Um, it may not come as a surprise to everybody in this room, uh, but the current process of engaging with Congress was designed around postal correspondence and has yet to adapt to new tools people use to engage with their members of Congress and vice versa on the internet and via social media. Um, constituent input is used to mo most universally to back up existing policy agendas. High effort and high reward. Staff and members value high-touch personal contact over low-effort apps and tools that facilitate easy engagement but provide little meaningful information about constituents. Mapping that entire ecosystem is the first step to building back up and making it look better and work better for everybody. And I guess I'll throw Molly the mic uh, That's to not talk how about. It works. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll throw Daniel the mic to Thank throw you. back to Molly <laughs> for where we go here. Um, I think the exciting takeaway, though, for the room here is building off of the efforts of these three pioneers, um, this is the meat and potatoes of Congress, right? When you strip away all the partisan things and sort of suspend partisan disbelief for one minute, um, so much of the frustration that people inside of Congress and outside of Congress are feeling towards each other comes down to these incredibly solvable issues of connectivity, 
critical infrastructure of engagement that we have solved everywhere else. And now the fun starts, right, bringing that into Congress. Thank you, Seamus. So, uh, Molly, did you like that? That was a good transition. So, so, so Seamus is deriding sort of, well, it's, it's kind of interesting, actually, because you're kind of having both ways. Like, the, the, you know, Amazon is famous for sort of one click, you know, one click to buy that thing that you didn't really need, but now you have it at your house the next day. But that's also part of the problem with the way folks are communicating with Congress. As your report talks about that, it's so easy. And I say this out of someone who works at an organization with two and a half million members where we do communicate with Congress a lot. Uh, these sort of, these communications with Congress is a way of indicating sentiment. Now, Molly, of course, you were at, at USDS. Seamus did a much longer introduction in stealing my thunder uh, in doing so. Can you talk about some of the findings and recommendations of, of this report that you, that you helped put out? Yeah, um, well, Seamus queued it up well. I think that um, essentially what we were aiming to do is sort of pull out the sort of patterns and themes that each one of these folks talked about, that we sort of had these different anecdotes, and then there's sort of this you know, since the most recent presidential election, this strong impetus for engagement coming from the outside. People had a notion that it should be easier. But what's happening once you've made something easier for people on the outside, for the poor folks on the inside, how do they respond to that? Um, and I think um, as someone who I, I, I worked at the U.S. Digital Service for three years and um, as someone who spent time in government trying to modernize and sort of redesign the way that we, it ha we, we propose the transactional relationship between government and its constituents. Indeed, many of the things that we found were extremely similar. Um, good, good intentions, uh, uh, desire to fix, uh, desire to serve, strong desire to serve, limited resources. This is for a room full of people working government, probably very familiar. Um, uh, limited exposure to opportunities and ways to fix these problems. So it's not that there isn't the capacity to make change, it's that people had limited access to understanding what would be available to them um, and how they would go about doing something like this. And then sort of the traditional limitations of what is the overarching institutional body requiring or limiting what are all the rules and regulations, what are the lawyers allowing us to do or not do. Um, and as is the case in most of the rest of government as well, this is just because many of the people shaping these policies and regulations don't come from the sort of 21st century age of working in the cloud and working digitally and working sort of technology first. It's not a lack of goodwill, it's just a lack of exposure. Um, so our, our intention for doing this work is to show both the appetite as well as sort of prioritize what some of the problems or opportunities are um, and hopefully bring some capacity both from outside and inside to, to help create opportunities for growth. So did you have like a top one or two recommendations for changes in the report? Was, is there something that you'd like to highlight? Do you have ones? You, you can go. Okay. <laughs> well, and they, and they can't be, well, Congress needs to triple its budget or right. Congress needs to hire double the staff, which would flow from the budget, or Congress needs to overhaul all of its rules all at once. <laughs> all of those are part of the longer term institution that we need, but if you put on a political hat for like 30 seconds, you'd realize that those are all not just non-starters, but laughable non-starters. And there's a war on, right? And we need to solve something today. And that, at least from my perspective, and I, I keep using the word superpower, but what Molly and her team were able to do was with a neutral view, strip aside all of the things that as a staffer, right, I got so hung up on, you know, the can't do, um, and say, well, where, what can we do now for, how is it gonna help which people, and how do we measure our success and progress moving forward? So Molly? So there's, it's sort of a, what, what, what do you find most interesting in terms of what the priorities are? So I'll answer it from my perspective. Yeah. Um, so there's two things, I think so fundamentally, the, the finding that Seamus pointed out, which I saw heads nodding to, which is that we're basically putting duct tape and band-aids on a system designed to function around a now relatively archaic, well, not archaic, but it's 10, 15 years behind the way that most people are trying to engage with their members of Congress. And so two things that sort of stand out as recommendations are um, kind of about pulling back our imagination of how things work right now and just sort of creating the space to design how it could work totally fresh. So one of those is particularly around the notion of social media, which is that, I think uh, Jessica, number one, sorry, it's just where you're sitting, um, <laughs> uh, mentioned that 
comms teams are often handling the social media work while the, court, the legislative correspondence teams are handling the traditional mail email. But increasingly people are turning to social media so they're not, so, so, so that kind of engagement isn't getting tracked and processed in at all the same way, even though it's, there's a great uptick and there's meaningful stuff happening there. So one recommendation would be to sort of start afresh, uh, reimagine what this would look like, where you've designed the resources within an office to respond to where the volume is coming in. Mm -hmm. And then sort of the second piece of that, um, which as a designer I get really excited about, is is it possible? So, so one of the challenges to not just fixing this set of problems, but many in government, is that they're high risk. People are busy. They have a lot on their plates. No one wants to be the failure. No one wants to sort of put themselves out there. But what if we could kind of create like a, a test tube to try things out? Um, is it possible to kind of pull uh, representatives from different offices together to kind of prototype what the physical configuration of an office could be or to test out different workflows or different systems where then you're not asking any single member to take on that risk, um, but we can try different things in sort of a lab. So those are the, some of the cool out there ideas. So Jessica Seal, so they're talking about going from like uh, Rube Goldberg to MacGyver, right? Like it's, it's, it's still taking the same pieces, but they're moving around in like different kinds of ways. You're dealing with tremendous problems of scale, uh, uh, tremendous restrictions on resources compared to historic norms. Does this ring true, what they're saying? Is it, is it not quite right? Like, wh what do you think? Sure, I mean, um, I think particularly with this president, I think we've seen an uptick on Twitter and people reaching out and and considering that really a public forum for how to interact. Uh, I think what, and every platform presents its own scalability problems, but I think really um, what I would love to see in the future is some kind of way to marry all the data that's coming in from social media and merge it in one data house with the letters and traditional email, mail, faxes, voicemails that we log that come in in our CRM. So just to give you an idea, we have a staff of seven people who go through our mail and emails and phone calls every week in addition to interns. Um, we have a much more limited comms team and our primary function is not to read your comments on social media. We just do it because we feel like that's our due diligence. So whether that means that I miss happy hour or you know, some unwind time on the weekend, sometimes that's what's required. Um, so I, and I, and we're also at the mercy of the tech companies, right? So in 2016, for example, the average number of replies that we had on a Facebook post was between two and 300. And then in November of 2016, Facebook rolled out a civic engagement um, layer called Town Hall, and our audience exploded, and we went from 250 or so to almost 10 times that mm. almost overnight with no expansion of staff. Um, there's no enterprise way to manage these types of incoming comms via Teams, right? So if I'm reading all of the comments on this and you want to take over halfway through, you don't know where I'm stopping. And they're not even necessarily you know, in, a, in right. a timeline. So trying to understand and listen to these comments in any kind of meaningful way, we're really inhibited by the platform, um, whereas you know, while the, the technology that we use to process traditional mail is more limited, it is efficient, right? Yeah. You can segregate it by people who are more top subject matter experts, who can respond directly to your question, um, who have met with stakeholders who are more informed, versus, you know, I'm sitting over here on comms and I have a, high, a, a, a surface level understanding of pretty much everything that goes on in our office, but I'm not an expert, so I'm just kind of triaging when I have time. Yeah, that's interesting. So Jessica Presley. So Jessica Seal, you're sort of in the, you have both leadership and personal office dual hack going on. Uh, Jessica Presley, you have like a different sort of space in this. You're in a different chamber. You have committee responsibilities. You don't necessarily have like the same, what, or do you? Do you have the same type of constituent communications problems? Sure. So I would say that, so oversight, we, we are very, uh, very focused on security. And so I think that what is an interesting layer to this entire conversation is something that is new to the United States government, and that is trolling. And that, 
that is bots, you know? And so a problem with a lot of elected officials is that you don't know who is actually a constituent of yours and who is sitting in a foreign country talking to you, pretending to be a constituent of yours. So how can we ensure that those comments are getting to the member of Congress or to the elected official and they're only seeing those that they actually represent, right? And so that is a very serious problem. And it's also uh, taking it one step further of the scalability of bots. You know, bots have exploded across the internet. And so now it's not even just someone sitting in a foreign country, it could just be machines all across the world who are now making completely, mm. Mm -hmm. We all know what we're saying, right? And so it's that scalability. It's and, that scalability and as is well. Is that a thing for committee staff as well? Like, because I know there's oh, like definitely. a different. Yeah. Tell me about it. Sure. So, so not only uh, do the personal offices deal with uh, with bots uh, or with with those problems, but as a committee, when okay, so for example, a judiciary. OGR, HIPC, the intelligence. Uh, these are the committees that are doing some of the, the most important investigative work. And so those are the committees that are doing the hearings. They, they are the ones that are investigating any, uh, any slights across the world. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. we are targets constantly. And, uh, and so that's why it's so incredibly important. We, for example, met with, uh, with Facebook and we told them this problem, and that is one of the main reasons that they came up with the constituent badge. And so now, when a member of Congress sees these different things, or a ranking member, a chairman sees these different comments coming through, and they, they know that that constituent badge is there, they feel safer yeah. that that truly is their constituent. So, and a constituent badge is something that someone in the district self-identifies that they live in, in Texas Fourth or whatever it is. Based on their, based right. on their address. But that, that, I mean, you just hit on the main problem with it, right? It's a self-identification. Mm -hmm. There's no verification process, and you can change it at will within a mm -hmm. set period of time. Mm -hmm. So I think once you say 22314 is my zip code, you have to wait two days before you can change it you again. the same zip code, anyway. Yes, uh, I'm just old down. I know. Um, so I, th I think that's a problem, but I mean, even in our traditional um, mail softwares, we have this issue where during the net neutrality open comment period with the FCC recently, I think 250,000 identities of Texans, actual Texans were stolen. And so we send the mail according to our processes, right? And then we're getting phone calls from people saying, why did I get this letter from you? I never contacted your office. But it's all of their actual identifying information, everything that we would ask for, that they would give us. And it's accurate. But it wasn't them. Right. So I think in the future, when you're talking about expanding civic engagement, the conversation that I don't think we've quite gotten to yet is how do we also protect and authenticate these communications? Mm -hmm. Was that an issue for mail? So like if I were to send in a letter, you know, so like one of, so we need, we need to go through all the stages of innovations and how people kind of troll Congress. But one of the big innovations in the '70s, of course, was uh, actually started with the, the the Christian right, where they started going to postcards, and then that became sort of throughout the system where people sent in, you know, you get a postcard in the mail. Maybe it's from you, maybe it's not from a real person. Either way, but you go and you send in tens and thousands of these these communications. When I was when I started on the Hill in 2001, like we would get stacks of like. So is th is this different because it's like so much worse in scale? Yeah, I think it's really the scale, right? Okay. And the and the fact that if you send in a postcard, you'll probably get a letter back from us. But if you're getting a letter from us on a topic about net neutrality, maybe you yeah. think that we're just doing a mail push, right? But if we send you an email, yeah, all of a sudden your alarms are going off. Um, mm -hmm. And and it wasn't limited to Texas. I don't. This is not a problem just for Texans. Yeah, this was California. I had a friend in Boston who uh, was asking me about this. Um, he didn't receive a letter from us, obviously but um, kind of all over the country. And I think as people start to think about protecting their identities, their willingness to share information with us so that we can authenticate it actually decreases. Yeah, no, that, that's how, and, and I'm gonna go to you. So, and the reason why I'm you know, sort of drilling down on this, this is not just a congressional problem, right? Like this is a regulatory problem as well for people filing comments and regulations, for people engaging in the executive branch process and not just for the legislative branch process. This is a, a common problem that, that government has, like is this a real person, do they want a real thing? 
Um, uh, is there a response in a timely kind of way? Is the volume greater than we can handle? I mean, the legislative branch is much tinier than the executive branch, both in budget and in terms of personnel, but it is a similar kind of problem. And there's also, if I want to engage in government, but I don't want to have my information exposed for security reasons or for other reasons, like are there avenues for folks to do that kind of thing as well? And, and Steve, I know you wanted to jump in. Um, I actually, when I read uh, OpenGov's report, from you too. Um, that was the most interesting recommendation that I read, was that they actually recommended um, that Congress as a whole should look at some type of uh, personality uh, identity uh, system. That, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be an improvement on the, on the current, yeah. because it's a real problem right now. And, it, and it's not just digital. Like, uh, back when it was postcards, I, I've been there long enough, I remember we used to, um, our district office zip code would be our number one zip code. Yep. Why is that? It's because you needed a zip code from our district to get yep. through our mail form. And you could find a zip code for our district from the district office right on our website. So people would fake the zip code. You know, and the same thing's happening, as Jessica was saying, uh, with uh, you know, people can fake the Facebook constituent seal. Yep. Now, you know, Facebook would tell you that they're taking numerous steps and they're constantly making it better so that people can't combat it as well. And, and they have better options. They have geo location and other stuff. And hopefully they're using more of that to to make it. Um, but it, it is one of the biggest issues. You all made a good recommendation. Um, I think the, the internet companies play a big role in this uh, because I, I, Facebook's constituent seal is a major step forward. I mean, that makes mm -hmm. Facebook a hell of a lot more uh, useful to all of us members of Congress. So We're far more likely to actually pull in all that data. But it also has to be open. So yep. when, when Facebook came and talked to us uh, and, and with their whole civic team flew them to Washington, and they were very proud. Uh, of their new tools that were coming. Uh, it was all about doing it inside Facebook, but not really opening it up at all. Um, and that was one of the biggest hesitations from us on, on staff, is that we got all these other systems. We're not going to move everything to Facebook. You know, we wouldn't want to move everything to Facebook to a single, single platform. So it's great that they're making innovations like the constituent badge, but they really need to, yeah. I think, uh, make it more open. So I'm hearing a couple of things. So one from, from Jessica Seal, I'm hearing integrated s communication systems coming in. So it's it's being, you can deal with it the way that you want to. You don't have to go into the different individual systems. What I'm hearing from you is also like this open and close. Let me actually sort of to the, to the entire panel. Um, so if you're on oversight and government reform, like you want to hear from everyone, presumably, right? You don't just want to hear from the people in, in Congressman Cummings District. If you're leadership, um, and you guys both represent leadership, um, there is some obligation to hear, is, well, is there, should there be, an obligation to hear from people outside your district. So if I'm really, really unhappy with the way things are functioning uh, in, in the people's chamber, uh, for example, as opposed to the other chamber, um, you know, should I be, you know, should I be able to contact uh, the congressman? I mean, does it, does it make sense? Is there, is there, should I be able to go through the leadership office? Or, or, does it, or does it make sense to really separate people out into well, so I live in Congressman Byers' district, so he's the only person that I get to talk to. And if I have a problem, then I can't talk to someone else. I can tell you how it currently works, at least in the House. I know um, most leadership websites, although not all, I think only some, like mm -hmm. we accept emails nationwide, um, but we are ex very clear that we don't give responses to all of them. Yeah. We do give responses selectively when we have very high volume on an individual topic. Um, that's how we manage it. Um, but part of it's just staffing. We'd love to have a nationwide LC shop that could actually handle all those communications, but yep. that's just uh, too much. Yep. And this also maybe goes to, and I want to bring Seamus Mal in. Like, so the way we currently have things set up for like communications, and, and, and I realize we're talking digital civic engagement. We've really narrowed our conversation here to communications about like constituent service requests and, and, and sometimes like policy programs. But there's other types of of civic engagement that we're not talking about here, um, uh, that we can't talk about if folks want to ask questions about those things. Uh, but, but in this context, right now, everybody's got their own shop, right? There's 541 more or less civic engagements. You know, the, you have plus pr committees. Plus committees. Well, pl right, plus committees. You have all the press people that have doubled the number or tri tripled the number since 20 years ago. Uh, there used to be a half a press person per congressional office in the 80s. Now it's in the Senate, it's, it's three-ish. Uh, you used to have sysadmins in the 90s. Now you don't have them at all. You have digital directors and digital folks. Like, but, but everybody's sort of duplicating the same kind of thing so that you have just, you know, everybody's doing their own responses. Is, does this make sense? Like, you know, every, like uh, Jessica 
uh, uh, Presley was talking about like every off, everyone's like their own small business. But Congress, is, one, it's not a business, but it's also not a bunch of small businesses, like it's actually an institution. Does it make sense to continue to think sort of one-offs like this? Or, or is there something else that you're recommending, or is this sort of outside your recommendations? And let's start with Molly, because <laughs> I'd rather do it that way. Um, I mean, in some ways, I'm not sure that I have the expertise to say, but I think, so the, the work that we did on this project was focus on what's happening behind the scenes, and I think in order to answer that question, I would want to do similar work on what's happening from the constituent perspective. Because like, what's the, what's the mental model that we as Americans have when we're contacting our local, state, federal representatives, and what's the experience that we're looking for? And then what mapping that to what's possible and uh, what we can imagine happening behind the scenes. I think that's what gets us to that answer. Yeah. Um, it certainly uh, would be, it's probably like fantastical right now to think about it working any other way, but it doesn't mean it's not worth sort of, and that's sort of what I was saying, if we could have yeah. some kind of like test bed to experiment with what that might yeah. look like. What I will say is I don't mm -hmm. think it's, from, from the experiences that we saw, I don't think it's duplicative. Because it's not so much that it's small businesses, it's like a, it's like a franchise mm. model in some ways. It's, it's like a franchise version of small businesses Big where government. there's overlapping work that happens, but there is unique work that happens. And you know, a lot of times it's someone inviting their member to come speak at their high school, or you know, and that is very specific to that person in their community, and that doesn't make sense for to get processed through some giant enormous warehouse. So, I don't think that the whole thing. I don't think that particular piece of the whole thing is broken, but I think in order to figure out what it could and should look like, we'd want to bring the American people into it and understand what they're kind of looking for. Okay, and we're going to go to Seamus, but just before we do there, we're going to go to questions after Seamus gives his answer, so be thinking of questions if you have them. If not, I've got plenty more as well. And just to, and I, before I answer your question right now, I just have to raise up something I heard a few minutes ago, which is we need to get the way that Congress handles social media up to the highly advanced stage of postal mail, right? That's crazy. Um, but that's the reality, right? It's a, it's a postal tune system. Um, but to, to Molly's point and to your question, um, like we hear all the time Congress is run like small businesses uh, without competition, right? If these were true small businesses, they would have been out of business a very long time ago, <laughs> uh, right? What, what business sees its input and workload go up 10x or more and cuts its budget and staffing and ability to deal with it, right? You'd be out of business in a month. That's the reality that is Congress, and that's really what's undergirding, I think, this entire conversation. Um, you know, when you look at um, individual offices having their own culture and remit to do things, um, that's awesome, and that's, that's great in certain ways, but there are core competencies and functions that the only way we're going to have a Congress that can function is automation, centralization, experimentation. We talk about four R's, right? To, to change a, a system in a place like Congress, you have to de-risk it. You have to bring in resources that don't exist today, whether it's from an outside group or from a leadership budget. Uh, you have to do the R&D and take that workload off of busy staffers, right? I want, I want my congressional staffers focused on being a congressional staffer, not experimenting out in a vacuum necessarily. And the fourth R, which this is Congress, right? You have to align that better, more positive outcome to the very self-interested re-election prospects of the people that you're talking about. We've all heard the saw, good policy or good, po good policy is the best politics. You know, good constituent service is the best politics. And that's the alignment that I think we're all talking about here. Members that are better engaging with their constituents at the scale that we're talking about are almost every single time going to be reelected. We're just so far away from that day right now. However, we hopefully, thanks to Molly, have a roadmap for, for really changing that dynamic pretty quickly. Thank you. So if people have questions, please head on over to the mics. Uh, and if you don't have questions, I've got plenty. Uh, so I, Can I, do, I answer that last question? Yeah, because I, I was going to yeah. go to you just on that. Please. Uh, so. I like the example of it wasn't that long ago that every member of Congress had a big server in the corner of their office. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a joke, it just to be this huge, loud. And of course, they had to have fans and air conditioner, and like, and it was a huge waste of money, you know. And so, 
they uh, finally got everything over into there's a house cloud. Yep. Um, so, and it's not even a real cloud because it's actually just out in Manassas. Uh, I wish it was on like AWS or something; it'd be a lot cheaper. But that's a whole other. It's discussion. a fake cloud. Yeah. Uh, it's a cloud. But uh, but that's a good example of that is centralized. It's saving every office money. No office misses having that server there. They all yeah. love it. It's so I think those are the kinds of things that are just obvious steps. And there's way more like that um, to to make Congress work better in uh, improving their systems. Yeah. And and we're about to go to question, but I, I would just say like I would also challenge this panel that like. Getting digital up to the level of dealing with letters is a terrible idea, right? You don't, you don't want to be replicating what you're doing with letters in the digital context, right? You, there is value in rethinking the way that entire engagement cycle goes, like getting out of like this one-on-one -on -one response kind of model and looking at sort of like when you look at what the Germans do, for example, there is a, you know, you send in a question to an intermediary, the intermediary, intermediary sends the question off to the member office. Uh, if it's a new question, it comes back and it's published online with the idea that you decrease the volume going to any particular office because if the question's already been asked and answered, you go to where it's been asked and answered so you don't have this 20,000 20, questions about where do you guys stand on net neutrality or whatever it is. But you know, would people be satisfied with that? Because I, I think that the number one complaint that we hear when we talk to people is, well, you sent me a form letter. Mm -hmm. But you asked a question that the form letter answers. Right. And you sent me a form petition. Yes. So you expect to get an individualized response directly from your senator who represents 28 other million other people, yeah. but you didn't bother to even write him a yeah. unique letter or ask a question that we haven't answered yet. Yep. So, so part, you know, part of what makes me push along these lines, so when you see members of Congress going on Reddit, and I'm not holding up Reddit as necessarily like the best example of a great place to have the most wonderful conversation, <laughs> but, when, but when you see members go there, um, you know, those that are more savvy, like, they end up having a positive effect where they're actually engaging. And I'm imagining sort of uh, uh, something that's sort of in between the two, where, you know, where do you stand on net neutrality? Instead of what I used to write, which is, you know, if you agree with me, I send, hey, it's so great that you agree with me. And if you don't, it's like, I'll keep your interests in mind when I vote on on the floor, you know, like that kind of response. But having more of a, like, you know, where you can elevate, like, the dialogue on policy and sort of push aside the trolls, like, there may be a way to move more in that direction. Uh, but maybe not. I'm, I, How do you do that while moving the needle on satisfaction, though? I don't know. So, sir. Well, this is Sunshine Week. And my question is, where's the sunshine? Or where's the enhanced sunshine? I can write a letter, send it by postal mail to my representative and get a namby-pamby answer back. Or I can send an email and get a namby-pamby email back. From this panel, I haven't heard how digital engagement is going to result in more sunshine, more transparency. All I hear really is that we can send out the same kind of communication faster to a greater number of people. So, so before I go to the panel, when you say more sunshine and more transparency, do you, what do you mean exactly? Well, I'll use an example from the executive. We have an executive in the White House who sends out lots of digital communications that are often full of mistruths and half-truths. And he's engaging in digital communication and we're getting more obfuscation, less accuracy in that communication. And so I imagine we can have the same thing from members of the Senate and the House. So digital does not seem to be contributing to sunshine. So, so I'm, I'm having a little bit, so is, is the concern that you're trying to express, and I, and, I, and I apologize if I'm just sort of missing it, is it that you're not getting what you think is an authentic response back, or is, that you, or is it that the communication that you're getting back is, is political in some way and you don't like that it's political, or, or am I missing it entirely? No, my concern is how this panel can describe getting more sunshine, or can it not? Okay, so Steve? I'll, um, one thing that bugs me is that, uh, you know, all these millions of people, as everyone said, uh, last year we got more mail than two or three years combined. Uh, and and what I think people are frustrated is because they send this mail, they're, they're fired up, they email their congressman, they call their congressman, and they get, you know, some canned response or whatever or no response. Um, and so people get really frustrated, really upset, they express that online. Uh, one thing that really bothered me was last summer, the height of that last year for us was in the middle of the ACA repeal debate. Our numbers were through the roof, our phones were ringing off the hook. And 
I just did a simple like search on Twitter for um, congressman voicemail poll, and I just, I just saw tons of tweets, just you know people just really upset that they uh, were trying to call their congressman and they couldn't even you know give a yay or nay uh, because they they couldn't even get through, uh, and if they did, they got to a voicemail that was full, you know even if the lines were busy. So that really bothered me, um, and it's one of the motivations for we made a quick micro site. Uh, to try to give more transparency to those incoming communications, to make those communications count. Uh, another problem was, you know, I know a lot of members get all those calls and emails, but then they never see any sunlight. Th those communications are just for the private audience of the staff and the member, you know, and often it never rises to the level of the member. It's only the staff who ever see uh, those communications. Um, so that bothered me that, the, you know, that those people's voice were not being uh, effectively heard. So we made a little microsite. It's called resistrepeal.org. It, uh, it uses free tools from Popbox, which uh, just allow anyone to sort of weigh in, yay or nay, on a bill. And we, so we did the ACA repeal, repeal bill was the bill. Um, and, but, but there, we told people, we said, go here. Because not only will, if you submit your opinion here, it'll generate three letters, one to your member of Congress and to your two senators. Um, but it also publicly display, like a big public scoreboard, your opinion. So that's new transparency. It actually showed the people scattered across a map, you know, all the colored for yays and nays. I thought that was really cool. It's really just building off the technology Popbox made, which is what made it really cool. Um, unfortunately, I, it didn't, it generated about 10,000 letters to Congress, but it didn't really take off. But that, that's the kind of thing that I like to think about really as a game changer in communicating with the public that does create new transparency. Yeah, Service. I'll just jump on that real quickly. Uh, thank you for bringing it back home. The point of all of this, right, is public responsiveness, satisfaction. It's not just, it's one thing to, to be told that I hear you. It's another thing to be truly listened to and responded to, right? That's, that's the piece of the puzzle. That's the lifeblood of our representative democracy that's just completely missing. One place where that we, we together uncovered, but mostly Molly and her team, um, was the lack of infrastructure for measuring that, right? You cannot manage what you're not measuring, and that lack of, of metrics of what success looks like. What, what is your definition of sunshine? What is your definition of responsiveness? What is your definition of quality? All of this is lacking in, in the culture across the whole capital, right? There are islands of excellence, but across the board. One thing I, I dream of and we're, we're really working on building the infrastructure to is analytics.gov, but for Congress, right? You can go to analytics.gov and you can look at the, the real-time web traffic of every executive branch property, uh, right? About this time of year, irs.gov is pretty high up there. Um, why can't we have that for every single member's incoming, right? Phone calls, emails, social media, faxes, and outgoing. Right? You can, so you can see who's sl getting slammed. So maybe you can build a little empathy where that over, over capacitated or over under capacitated staff maybe is going to take a little longer to get back to you. Um, but solving for the problem that Steve talked about, I think, is what we're all trying to do in our own ways. Um, a product that we developed off of the user centered research is called Article One. Right? When you call your congressman, you should never get a busy signal or a full voice mailbox. Like that is patently unacceptable. Um, I mean, it's even led uh, a certain former chairman of the majority side of the committee mm -hmm. to unplug his phones, right? What bigger middle finger to the American people and their role in our representative democracy than that? Or things that have caused fax machines to get unplugged, right? That's just unacceptable. And so we built this tool called Article One, which uses the same type of technology that advocacy-driven groups use, your airline uses to create a virtually limitless voicemail box so that at the very least, right, we're starting about it with the world as it exists today, nobody's gonna call Congress and wonder if their call got through and get into a black hole and no one's gonna get a full voicemail box or busy signal. From there we can build up, but that's a really important question. Thank you. So Jessica Presley, do you think that greater empathy for what's happening inside Congress around like the volume of calls that they're receiving, do you think that that, uh, or, or how different, you know, like? Is that going to change uh, people's expectations in terms of how they get a response back that they feel like they're being heard? Do you think, is that, will that help sort of close the circle here or, or is there something more than that that's needed? Well, you know, like you, like you were saying. So at one time we had letters and yeah. then we had phone calls and then we had emails and now we have social. Something really beautiful has happened. You know, the social has given people an opportunity to to connect with their member in a way that was unprecedented. 
you know, so many years ago. And so maybe something is this, you know, using technology and automation and the tools that we have, and this is just one idea that I'm throwing out that I heard recently online, you know, what if we had, instead of form letters, you know, when people are doing, um, calling in and getting a, a response back, why wouldn't it be a good idea to maybe have the form letter responses up online, right? So you can just search on the website and then you get your response back. Now here's an interesting flip side. Will the elected official want all of those form letters mm -hmm. up on their website for everyone to look? Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. I personally think that would be great you know, for transparency. Mm -hmm. So then we can actually see what all these responses are. Um, what do you think? Do you think that people would actually like something like that? Yeah. It's expectation setting, right? When I go to Comcast, I go to the user-generated FAQs. That's a natural thing. You know, when we, when we started developing Article 1 last year, some of the initial questions were, ooh, there's an IVR in there. Uh, that's the automated sort of phone tree that gets, collects the data up front automatically and gets you to the right person to get a better response. Well, the answer is like, I'm pretty sure we're all trained on using that type of technology. Why? Because it handles engagement at scale. Um, I think this goes to what Molly, Molly was talking about really eloquently earlier, which is like, we have a problem, let's make it bigger and let's raise our sites. And the answer usually has existed elsewhere. It just hasn't been brought to bear on this thing called the relationship between elected officials and, and their constituents. There's also experimentation going on, like uh, Congressman Beto O'Rourke uh, on his Facebook, it's completely open. He responds to absolutely everything. His website is like nothing. It just says go to his, his Facebook uh, where they reply to everything. So it is, and so that's a way of what we're talking about, like being completely transparent um, with your, when you communicate with your uh, constituents. Just make every single one public so that everyone can see. Yeah. Jessica? I mean, what is the difference between me, like us putting the form letters that we send on each topic on our website so that you can just download them instead of e emailing us. And the 50 or so pages of information I already have on these topics under the issue section, that is by far the lowest traffic area of our site. Our contact form accounts for almost 70% of our website traffic, one page, right? Um, no, your people are not even, yeah. That's great. That's no, no, it's not very like interesting. Like, uh, I don't think our LC team loves me for that, but yeah, we, yeah. and we're uh, we're optimizing it now. Um, but you know, if you, I don't understand. Like, we can create new ways for you to consume the same information, but the bottom line is the information is already there. Yeah. Well, so that's part of what was raised in the last panel. Like, you know, you're putting information up on your website, uh, and I mean, I do the same. We. we Everyone does this, right? You put it in the hopes that people who are interested in what does Senator Cornyn think about this, they're going to type in Senator Cornyn and immigration, and they're going to go to that page. And it turns out that people who have an opinion, whatever it is, like the first thing they do is like, I'm going to share my opinion. Not like, I'm going to go and do considered research on this thing, and I'm going to figure out what's the appropriate policy, right? Like, you know, you, you get, how many emails do you get about bills that don't even exist? Hey, you know, I read this thing, and it's HB63, you know, it's like some fake thing. Right? I mean, that, like, I mean we, uh, when I was doing that, like, we got thousands of these communications about a bill that wasn't even real because it was some sort of stupid chain email back in the, in the turn of the century. So, so right, right, and people like, I'm so angry about this thing that is a state issue, not a federal issue, and by the way, I don't even have a real bill number because I didn't realize, you know. Like, so, you, so people naturally are going to go and, and communicate. Uh, I mean, part of what we heard a little bit before, like in the last panel, was like the idea of like a chatbot, which I don't, you know, like, like having some sort of a way of, you seem to be emailing on this, but did you know that this is not, you know, like, which, which, yeah. which would, if I got it, I'd probably irritate me, but, but maybe it would actually be useful. And I, I imagine yeah. Alex Howard from the Deputy Director of the Sunlight Foundation is slowly staring at all of us as we have this conversation. <laughs> Hi, Alex. Hi, Daniel. Um, can I, can I jump in but, with but, one but, thing quickly? Yes. Um, I Sorry, just Alex. wanted to, to follow up with your question which is something I think that's very important to the conversation about modernizing government, which is that digitizing and improving the way that we design and implement the transactional piece of government is not the same as transparency. Um, and you can very much do that work without being open about it and the other way around. You can make things very open and still have very kludgy old systems. You can build beautiful, seamless interactions that nobody has access to what's happening behind the scenes or the information that's coming through. So, and I think this body more than the other parts of government 
has a lot of reasons not to be super transparent, but I think the number one is not all the things that we think about in terms of the politics and the dynamics, it's how incredibly resource burdened this group of people are, yeah. um, and how basically any initiative to do that we saw and you're talking about is just people who are passionate and care deeply about it doing going above and beyond. Um, and that to me I think is, you asked a question about empathy. Yep. I don't know exactly There's the answer no to that, but I think people have very little understanding that oftentimes that's the fundamental reason that this work isn't more out in the world, at least for like, you know, maybe 75% of the topics. <laughs> yeah. no, that's right. So, Alex. So, uh, quick, just detail. It's uh, analytics.usa.gov. Ah, For people go. who want to check it Thank out, you. super cool. You can see which websites in the United States government that are participating in the analytics program are popular at a given time. It's a real-time dashboard of civic interest. And what you all are talking about here is a little bit, like what are people interested in? What can we give them in response? And some of that's really powerful. I just came from the Department of Justice this morning, and they gave an award to someone who's, by proactively disclosing what people are interested in, they can decrease the demand of Freedom of Information Act requests. Now, it's worth pointing out, Congress is not subject to the Freedom of Information Act, and that is not by accident. Uh, so there is some limit to transparency in terms of how willing you all are, frankly, uh, open to us holding you accountable. That being said, there's another thing I wanted to point out about digital engagement, and I think the gentleman here spoke to it a bit. You mentioned that this empowers your bosses and you to be public with all of the public, right? Huge opportunity, we're all connected now. The United States is a huge place, so millions upon millions of people can now follow their person, they can connect to them, they can even like their page. The trouble is that, as we've seen at every level of government, those same people are blocking them. So to your point, they can now do this? No, they can't, because there's a lot of examples where elected representatives are blocking their constituents based on viewpoint. Now. There are people who are suing right now to establish that the President of the United States needs to stop doing that because that is repressing the ability of people to follow the official statements of the President on the Internet, right? Um, you can't comment if you're blocked. You can't talk to other people if you're blocked. Everyone knows you can log out and find them somewhere else and God help us, there's plenty of places to see what the President said on the Internet. <laughs> but this is not true at other levels of government. And what we're seeing as we're talking about Sunshine Week is in digital engagement, it's allowing people to talk but not have to listen. It's allowing them to throw up walls where we're saying we're being transparent but we're not holding town halls. It's allowing them to push out press releases but not actually be accountable to the people they're supposed to serve. Now, I'm really empathetic with you and your bosses on this count because the voices of the American people are more amplified than ever before. We have more ways to talk at Congress than before, and as you pointed out, if you read the Open Government Foundation's research in this, they have poorer ways of listening than ever before. Constituent ID is a, a thing. You should work on that. I would hope that you maybe work with the federal government because they have a huge problem with fake and fraudulent comments now. And it's going to get worse. The internet's going to be poisoned as a forum for discourse, for rulemaking, or for constituent communications. But I guess what I'd ask you is, are your bosses blocking people? And if so, would you be transparent about when and where that's happening? And are you going to take some risks in terms of inviting constituents in to give feedback on the legislation you're proposing? Because I can tell you this last year hasn't been pretty. There's been a lot of things that have been pushed through that have been huge omnibus bills yet again that people have very little time to read. And if we're really going to be honest about digital engagement and communication and transparency, opacity by design is what it looks like when you push up a big bill and then rush it through. It's not good enough. Are you going to commit to A, being transparent about blocking people, and B, about giving people the opportunity to know what it is your bosses are voting on so that they really feel like they have a voice in government? Because I think we all know the marks so far aren't very good on this institution. And I want to see them get better. So two questions then, uh, blocking and uh, sort of institutional transparency around the decisions that are being made. Steve, you want to go first? Yeah, I'm happy to go first, Alex. Thanks for the question. Um, we, I, I sort of, I think we think of it in two ways. There's the official channels, which we never block anyone. So that's like, you know, phone calls, uh, emails coming in. You know, we check for uh, zip code. Uh, but on social media, um, we do very occasionally block. Um, we are very clear in our 
we have a privacy statement in our about section on, on like our Facebook, for example. And then we um, very rarely block people only usually when they're obscene um, or you know, aggressively obscene. Uh, but if you look at our Facebook page, you'll see there's an enormous amount of dissent, uh, often in, uh, obscene, and we, we don't block it. Uh, so yeah, we very rarely, but I do think that's a, an issue. I mean, I, I think that, was it the judge who just suggested, you know, like muting instead of blocking? I mean, I think there's, you know, it doesn't have to be black or white, um, but I do think it's important that social media more and more is the official way uh, that people, when they think about, oh, I want to communicate with my member. I mean, our website, you're right, with us, our website is almost all the contact form, but overall, our website traffic is actually going down. Yeah. Because more and more people, when they Google, you know, or when they just think about contacting their member of Congress, they go to social media before, so, before I their member. I don't so. know if I would generalize that, though, because ours has exploded. Yeah. Well, I think it increased last year, but I think the trend has been, uh, has been going down for us, at least. So just uh, blocking? Sure. Just so as a, as a committee, things are just a little bit different, I think, yeah. for us. Uh, there was some instances that we had to work with House Security on bots. Uh, so I guess, so Facebook and Twitter. Facebook, just let anything be said. Uh, when it comes to Twitter, we worked with House Security. And we never block. We only mute. And we only give it uh, for specific handles that we are thinking could be trolls or bots. Jessica? Um, so we don't operate an official Twitter account. We have the member of level, it's his personal account, um, and I will often, from my personal account, respond to people. To people, um, I tend to mute people on mine just because then I can still see them in my tweet deck when they're talking to him. Um, I, on on Facebook, we do we will occasionally block people, um, primarily based on profanity. Meaning, you can do a cursory look at our Facebook page and tell that we're not deleting people for dissenting. That's like 90% of the comments. Um, and I think that it's just uh, related to a number of things in terms of the political environment we're in and the state and his position. Uh, but no, we don't, we don't block based on, on political dissent. Uh, we, it would be much easier just to not utilize Facebook at all if that were going to be our position. Yeah, that, that's, that's funny. Like one of the things that we've been thinking about, what are the implications of this research in this moment is actually if we just pull the plug in Facebook, it'd probably be better off for everybody, right? Because you would, staff would have more capacity to meaningfully engage with their constituents. And they wouldn't be chasing down all the, what's happening there, same with Twitter. Um, which we haven't really touched on this year. We've alluded to Facebook and Twitter, and those are, I think, just stand-ins for large online uh, communities that are engaging with, with elected officials. Um, for all the press releases that you see and all the, the letters to the public and shareholders, those companies are not in the business of facilitating meaningful engagement between an individual and their elected official, right? They are not in the business of healthy democracy or healthy functional representative democracy unless it has a direct benefit on their share price, right? But we are, by de facto, somehow we woke up and every member had a Facebook page and felt compelled to use it and engage there without thinking of how do we create the infrastructure to meaningfully engage there. And the companies certainly aren't going to help unless it's in their, in their financial interest. I'm not saying to turn off Facebook, but like at least let's measure its impact and, and treat it seriously. Yeah. And, There's and, a question and, and for one, like I deleted my Facebook account two years ago uh, for reasons of it's not designed to help us. It's designed for other purposes. Right. Like Remember, there's a, a, a sort of a network effect. And, and, I, and I just sort of wanted to sort of add I this point sort of parenthetically, like we've dealt with some of this before in other venues, like in, in limited First Amendment forums, you know, you have problems of hecklers, right? You know, if someone comes in and, and starts heckling me, one, that'd be kind of fun. Like, I'd, I'd actually like that, but... <laughs> You're but, a bum! But I'm, but I'm kind of crazy that way. But, but most of the time for hecklers, like, you've got ways of dealing with them. Uh, you don't, even if the government holds a public forum and someone comes in and doesn't follow the rules and they disrupt it in that kind of way, um, uh, then... Uh, you know, you can throw them out, you can stop them. But at the same time, there's also like, you know, levels of dealing with this. And I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm running us out of time, so I want to go to our, our question over here just very quickly. Excuse me, I'm here first. Uh, no, actually, ma'am, he was first in the year after him. I'm I think. here first. Oh, ma'am, I apologize. Go ahead. Very quickly, please, if it's a question, please. I may be very slow. I reserve my time. Thank you for your presentation from the Congress, especially. I think. Congress, whether you have the digital engagement, you should learn some lessons. Digital engagement only improve your effectiveness, supposedly. 
and your productivity. But the problem is way back to the digital in engagement, people are suffering. And you know the approval rating of Congress is very low, but actually it's not just Congress, it's three branches of government from local to federal to global. So I wonder if you can really re-evaluate the problem. The problem is currently a lot of non-voters, they are unhappy, a lot of elderly, they are suffering, a lot of veterans, their benefits are deprived of, and all the social benefits, even employment benefit, they don't really give it to the beneficiary, supposedly recipients. Mm -hmm. So I would like you to reevaluate in the digital engagement era, it's a lot of internet or social media, not just by obstructed by your staff, but also by other people, uh, internet or PPP people. Okay. So I would like you to reevaluate your productivity, currently the so-called employment or job or economy, those are really misleading because they are hire people to hacking other people, to rob other people's access, account, and everything. Okay, so you must have a lot of opportunity to evaluate all this. Mm -hmm. You must concentrate your productivity to benefit the society, right, thank, not benefit thank the you. money. Well, let's, let's go to our, our, our folks. Uh, but let me get his question in as well so they can answer either or both of yours as they wish. Sir, just very quickly, please. Yeah, sure. Um, I come from a bit of a startup background, so I think about this a little bit differently, so maybe you can help educate me about how things work in government differently. But I hear you all saying a lot about resource constraints. And so I think if there were a unified system for to like read in mails and faxes and emails and everything, you mean natural language processing, efficiency, sentiment analysis, maybe that could ease the burden on some of the staff and therefore make things easier, number one. Number two, in terms of the sunshine piece of the transparency, um, I understand that each sort of office may be running and it's like a little pod in, in an, you know, an ecosystem, but is there some sort of body that is creating at least a prototype of a system that would enable transparency to constituents that somebody, an office who didn't want to develop their own thing on their own could latch onto and run with? Okay. So uh, everyone will get a shot. We're going to do it quickly because I know that we are out of time. We're just about out of time. Okay. Uh, I'm seeing the end sign. So 30 seconds each, starting Molly. If, answer what, it, whatever you'd like or make a closing um, comment if you wish or you can pass. So uh, I'll, I'll pick up the first part about uh, automating, essentially. Um, lots of good ideas. I think lots of energy and interest around that stuff. Then we run into the regulatory challenges of procuring and acquiring that sort of set of technology inside. I think that just becomes part of the larger work of modernizing the way that Congress is working. So the specific technology may be broadly applicable or maybe specifically applicable, um, but it becomes uh, an interesting additional barrier to figure out how to get that in, how to get that through security, how to get that improved so, approved so folks like this could use that in their day to day. Thank you, Seamus. Yeah, that's that's the 64, where'd you go? That's the $64,000 question. Um, when I was on the stage last year, we were talking about a plan for a congressional digital service, uh, which has you know, unfortunately kind of gotten behind all the other crazy things that are happening right now in the news. Um, but that's what it's getting at, right? It's a chicken and an egg problem. The institution of Congress has disinvested in itself to such a level that there is zero capacity to do anything new or differently. And we're stuck. And the approach that the Open Gov Foundation takes is adding those four R's, right? It just takes a little bit. Like our project for the user-centered research was less than $250,000, the whole thing, to get Article I to meaningfully, measurably solve the problem that is full voice mailboxes and busy signals, and phone-based engagement took about $150,000. Like in a $4.3 billion budget, yep. like the money's there. It's just a question of someone raising their hand and saying, we need some help, can we spend this better? Um, but that's a political question, which these guys are far better prepared to answer. Steve? Yeah, the ledge branch approach, which is what Shane was just referring to, has been frozen for six years, something like that. Uh, and so, and one thing I've learned, uh, one thing I've worked on in policy is uh, uh, trying to use uh, bills to modernize the executive branch, like through work that we uh, are doing right now on uh, the MGT Act. You've got to spend a little money in order to, like, get the, the known 
cost savings even. Um, you know, like you know that some things are really inefficient and everything, but inevitably it costs some money to just get off the old system. Um, but you know, any business person would of course do it because you have the business case because you know there's money to be saved, um, but you're just stuck with the chicken and the egg. Um, and going to her question, uh, I find it uh, appalling at uh, Congress's uh, approval ratings, and and even if we do a hell of a lot better job than we currently are doing on digital communications, um, I, I think that'll improve our approval rating, but probably not much. But um, but I do think it's uh, we're lucky to be in an age where there's so much more uh, improvements that can be made in this area that I do think will markedly improve uh, civic discourse. Jessica. So uh, there's actually a lot of really interesting things happening right now in government. It's, 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 uh, it's, sometimes it's difficult to figure out all the different hearings and all the different legislation because there's just so much and it's so much to digest. Uh, but like Steve was saying, you know, uh, we have the MGT, which came from the ITMA, which is to move uh, technology to more efficient systems. We've got some really great, we just had two of three different AI hearings uh, that is talking about automation and where we should be going forward and research and development. And so there's a lot of really exciting things that are happening and that will be happening. But it really takes people to, to talk to their members of Congress and say that, yes, they do, they do want that modernization. And yes, it's, it's organizations like yours that, that are showing that, you know, yes, we can make things, you know, open and more efficient. Um, and so, yes. Great. Thank you. Upper Chamber, Jessica. <laughs> uh, I think as a direct response to your first question, just kind of a nuts and bolts answer, um, the primary issues that I think we run into in terms of efficiency is that we have multiple data houses. I don't have an automated way to process comments across all social, me social media in the same way that I do traditional commentary processes. And so I would really like, even from an analysis standpoint, to be able to see all of that data in one house and understand it a little bit better, more holistically. Um, secondarily, in terms of sentiment analysis, uh, when I was at the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, we used some really great sentiment analysis tools, some great data visualizations. Um, you know, they require a little bit of tweaking to be directly applicable. When I moved over to the Senate side, I found out that until the latter part of 2015, um, is actually against the Senate rules to spend money on third-party analytics analysis. Um, that rule has since been changed. It was a long process requiring member-level action, bipartisan, um, and it took about 11 months. Um, but secondary to that, I mean, we still, you still don't frequently see them used because, um, one, they, they're not always directly useful to how, how we need a tool, and it's not profitable for someone to tweak them so that they are directly useful. And second, their they're good ones are really expensive. So it's been a pleasure being up here with folks who are really leading the effort to uh, modernize digital engagement in Congress. And I hope that you'll join me in thanking them for their time. Thank you. Daniel, thanks very much. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, we're going to pause for a short break. Uh, we're going to try to resume right on time at 4 p.m. Senator Leahy is supposed to be joining us. Um, so if you could be back promptly at 4 o'clock, that would be great. There are restrooms right outside the theater that you can use. Also, the Charters Cafe may still be available for snacks. Um, no snacks or drinks allowed in the auditorium, though. So we'll, uh, we'll take a short break. Please come back. <laughs>